John chapter 21 this morning and bring to you a message kind of leading up to Easter and the thought of the purpose of Easter and the after effects of Easter and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that came at Pentecost. One of the key figures through the whole story prior to the crucifixion, in the midst of the crucifixion, and even after the crucifixion, and the powerful preaching at the day of Pentecost was a man named Peter. And I want to bring to you a message about him today in preparing Peter for Pentecost. There's a lot of things that happened, and I want to bring to you a very well-known story of Peter, John chapter number 21. All who find your place there, let's stand together, all who can and will. And I want you to stand, and we're going to sing. No, we're going to sing. We're going to read. <laughs> i got singing on my mind this morning. We're going to read to you uh, the first, let's say, five verses. And then I'll read to you the whole passage here in just a little bit. But it says in John chapter 21, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel and Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and the two other of his disciples. Or, and the two other of his disciples. And Simon and Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. And they said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they called nothing. But when the morning was come now, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time together today. I thank you for the beautiful song we've just heard. There is a miracle in the making in each and every one of our lives today. There is a miracle in the making for Peter. And on this day, the story that I was reading, very fitting that that song was chosen. Lord, and I thank you for orchestrating the things in our lives and the things in our services here. Lord, I pray you'll touch our hearts. Lord, speak to us the things that you would have us to hear, that it will be a blessing to us and help us in our daily walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Again, I want to bring to you this passage out of the entirety of chapter 21. I'll continue reading the chapter, and then we'll bring to you the message. So here's the scenario. I'll get you up to speed. The crucifixion had already occurred. The resurrection had already happened. He had already presented himself twice to the disciples to show that he was alive, and this is the third time that he's come to show himself to the disciples. I'm sure that they were emotionally drained from the events that had taken place. They had lived for three years with Jesus on the road, traveling, seeing the miracles performed, seeing all the things that had been done. And then he gives them this news, hey guys, I've got to die now. I'm sure they were a little bit upset, to say the least, about that. And then they saw him being taken. They saw him and the events that happened there and, and the Peter having his ear cut off and all those things. And then he, you know, Jesus had talked to Peter on the side and Peter said, I'll never leave you, Jesus. And Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. You're going to deny you even know who I am. He said, not so. And he was all upset and then he did the very thing Jesus said he would do, and he realized that, and I'm sure he was heartbroken, and Peter was, I'm sure, was emotionally and, and spiritually and physically drained by this point, and he needed a little bit of an escape. He needed a little vacation, if you will, and that's where he says, all right, guys, I've had enough. I'm going to go fishing. They said, you know what? That sounds pretty good. We'll go fishing with you, too. So they go out, and keep in mind, these are professional fishermen. This is what they do for a living. And they go out, they're trying to do what they've always done, what they're best at, what they're good at. And the Bible says that night they caught nothing. These are the experts. And they're physically drained, emotionally, spiritually. They're just slap, wore out. And they go out to do what it is they do best and they come up empty-handed. 
Don't that feel like your life sometimes? Don't you feel sometimes like you just come up empty, empty handed everywhere you turn, even though you turn to the things that you feel you know the best? That's exactly what was going on here. It says, verse 4, But the morning was come, and Jesus stood on the shore. And they didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. I'm sure they were kind of wondering, you know, we do this for a living, guys, you know. This guy, we don't even know who this is. He's telling us what we're supposed to be doing. We're the ones that do this every day. And we got some, just God shows up telling us what we're supposed to be doing. But they do it anyway. They're probably so tired and wore out. They figure, let's humor this guy. Let's just prove him that he's wrong. So they cast this side on the other side of the ship. And it says they were not able to draw it in for the multitude of fishes. I've been fishing a lot in my lifetime. And ain't a whole lot of difference on the left side of the boat and the right side of the boat. You're just right there in the same piece of water. They've been fishing all night. He said, well, try the other side of the boat. They couldn't even pull the net in. They had so many fish. And they hadn't caught any fish all night long. You think the fish were just hanging out on that one side and not going out? I mean, I don't know. I'm sure God spoke to the whale, right? And he told that whale for Jonah, we remember that story, that he told that whale to be at the right place at the right time to do the right thing. He could have been speaking to these fish too, keeping them on that one side of the boat all night long, I don't know. But they cast the nets over, and it says it couldn't even draw in the nets. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, and he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. So they're bringing this thing into the seashore. And, they, and as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire on the coals, and fish laid there on the bread. Imagine that. This dude said, cast it on the other side. They bring in all these fish. They show up, he's already got a fish. <laughs> he's sitting there cooking it before they even brought it up out of the water. And they had their fish and bread. I want you to keep that in mind. And Jesus said unto them, Bring up the fishes which ye have caught and have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. <clears throat> and for all there were so many, yet the, the net was not broken. And Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples does ask him, Who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. By then, they'd figured it out who this person was. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and the fish likewise. Does that sound familiar? What other miracle did he perform with the loaves of fishes and bread? Amen. Very fitting that he would reveal himself through the similar miracle he had performed in the past that they had witnessed. God will show himself to you over and over again, and you will know that it's God because of what he's already done for you in the past. And man, that's what he was doing here. That's why I said remember that it was fish and bread that he was making there. And this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, notice what he calls him here, Simon. He didn't call him Peter. He called him Simon. That's significant. Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, I, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said unto him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself. And walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou goest. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, 
follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, named John, which he also leaned on his breast at supper, back at the last supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? He remembered all that that occurred. And Peter, seeth him, and seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, if I, will, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die, yet Jesus shall not said unto him, he shall not die. That's not what Jesus said. He simply said, if thou will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? He's asking a pointed question. This is the disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also other many things that Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written therein. Amen. Some amazing things we learned from chapter 1. And what God was doing through this chapter, through these questions, and through this lesson, he was preparing Peter for the tail end of his life. He was preparing Peter for Pentecost, for the most powerful preaching he probably ever done, for the most purposeful part of his life yet to come to carry him through to the rest of his life. That's what Jesus was doing. Now I want us to look at a few things. John chapter 1 again is where we're at. The first thing I want to see is out of verse 5, which is the simple question that asks for the facts. Again, I want to turn our focus to Peter as we're collecting our thoughts today. Peter went from the greatest failure to the greatest firebrand, as it's called, or being on fire for God, being excited for what's going on. You see, Peter had denied his Lord three times by fire. But then he declared his Lord on Pentecost in fire and powerful preaching as the Holy Spirit came and said he came and sat on them like a fire of cloven tongues. He became excited. He became set on fire for God. Between these two points, Peter decided to go fishing, to turn to the one thing that he felt he was good at, to turn to the one thing he'd always found comfort in is what was going on there. To turn to the one thing that he felt for sure would bring him a little bit of comfort and pleasure and escape, if you will, from the things that he was facing. Many people have criticized him uh, for what he did. And, and what he was doing is trying to escape a little bit, trying to regain some control in his life, trying to find those things and what he'd always found them in before. But God did not allow him to catch a single thing that night for a reason. He was preparing Peter for Pentecost. He was preparing Peter for a larger purpose in his life. What is God doing for you right now that's preparing you? Maybe you've turned to things you've always turned to. Maybe you draw to those things that's always given you comfort, rest, and refuge, but you find them not in those things anymore. God's trying to prepare you for something bigger, for something more powerful going on that's going to happen to you in the future. The three questions from Christ, which was the same question over and over again, was preparing Peter for Pentecost. The simple question, that Jesus asked regarding the facts of the matter was, he asked them in verse five, children, have you any meat? He was getting through to the point that they needed something and they were looking for something that they couldn't find of themselves. They needed meat, they needed substance, they needed fulfillment. And Jesus asked them, have you any meat? That's what he was really asking. But on the surface, we ask the same question. Every time I go to the beach, go to the lake, and I see somebody with a fishing pole, what do we always ask them? Now, are the fish biting? Did you catch anything yet? You know, we ask that type of question. That's essentially what Jesus was asking, but he was getting to a much deeper meaning. Do you have substance in your life? Do you have what you really need in your life? That's what Jesus was asking. And what did they answer him? They said, no. They were a group hungry, 
tired and discouraged disciples. They had fished all night, doing their profession, doing what they knew best, and had been unsuccessful at every turn. I'm sure that they were getting extremely frustrated with what was going on. They had caught nothing. And many of us are just like them. We're defeated. We're exhausted. We're trying to find some level of comfort, some level of fulfillment in our lives, yet we're turning up empty-handed everywhere we turn. Why? Because we're turning to the things of ourselves. We're turning to our own skills and abilities. We're turning to the things that have made us happy in the past. We're not turning to the one who holds our future in his hand. And that's what Jesus was trying to get at today. Jesus called to the disciples and he asked them this life-changing question. Have you any meat? He might have asked a little less pointed question. And how's the boat holding up? How's the water? How's the weather, guys? Is the moonlight just right for you tonight? He could have asked all types of questions. But he asked them the most important question that he's going to ask you today and every day of the rest of your life. Have you any meat? Do you have what you truly need in this life from your efforts that you're exerting right now? They said no. And most of us would probably have the same answer if we answered that question honestly. Jesus already knew their answer, by the way. He already knows your answer. If he were to ask you a question today, it's not because he's seeking an answer. It's because he knows you're seeking for an answer. Jesus already knows all things. But he needs you to realize what your greatest needs are. He needs you to ask those questions of yourself. And he needs you to come up with the answer. I do that in teaching all the time, and we're told not to give students the answers anymore. And I, I get that. They want us to ask questions when the students ask us questions. We're supposed to ask them questions. And it frustrates the kids because all they want is an answer. But what we as educators want, and what Jesus as your master wants, is for you to discover the answer for yourself. For you to truly see the answer come alive to you from the pages of the Bible, from the moments you live in life. He wants you to see the answers, for you to get the answers for yourself. And that's why he asked them that question. He's wanting them to know the answer. He already knew the answer. But he wanted them to tell him what their needs were. He wants you to tell him what your needs are. He wants you to come to him for help and for assistance with the things in your life. He knows how things are in our lives, but he longs to have us to tell him about it. You know, when we go through a hard time, we want to talk to somebody. Half the time, for some reason, the last person we turn to talk to is the first person we ought to turn to, and that's Jesus. He's the only one that can truly, really help you anyway. He wants you to turn to him. And he asks us these questions. And he wants us to turn to him. Before we can be saved, we must first admit, admit that we're lost. I've heard that preached all the time. You can't get a person saved until you first get them lost. They've got to realize they're lost. They've got to realize their need for a Savior before they'll ever turn to him. That's why uh, myself and many other preachers have so much of a problem with preachers that don't preach against sin. They don't preach against the wrong things about people. They just want to make everybody feel good about themselves so they'll give more money to the church and go home and say, oh, that preacher made me feel good today. Well, I tell you, all make a preacher want to make you feel bad about yourself because then that's when you really get to change. That's when you realize all the things that's wrong with you so that you'll get them turned around and make them right through Jesus. That's the point. It's to ask us ourselves these questions, to tell the answers to Jesus, the only one who can truly help you with your problem. Before he can fill us, we need to admit that we are empty. Before he can help us, we need to admit that we are hindered in our lives, that we have nothing of ourselves that we can lift ourselves up with. Sometimes he has to bring you to the absolute very most bottom of life before you can turn to the right things of this life, which is Jesus. Nothing of this life will help you by the way, only Jesus will. You cannot turn to a job. You cannot turn to a person. You cannot turn to a drug. You cannot turn to anything and get true help in this life. There's nothing in this life that will give you what you need. Only Jesus. 
And sure, we can help each other, but we're not truly the solution to all the problems of the people around us. It's Jesus through us that's going to help. Amen? Y'all with me today? we got to look to Jesus. We can't look to tactics and tricks and, and all these sorts of things. we got to turn to the truth. And that is Jesus Christ himself turning to him. And that's what Jesus was trying to get Peter to do on this day. To truly admit that he was nothing without Christ. He went out and did what he's always done best at, fishing. And he came up empty handed. He had nothing to show for his long night of efforts. He had nothing. And Jesus just said, hey, put it on the right side of the boat. I don't think that was coincidental. I think that it was on the right side of the boat to teach us we need to start making the right kind of choices. Not the wrong kind. You're not talking about right hand or left hand. He's talking about the correct side. Amen. Are you turning to the correct things in life? Are you turning to the correct things that are going to help you in your life? He asked a simple question. He asked for the facts. If I were to ask you today for the facts of your life, what would the answer be? Do you have any meat? Do you have true substance in your life? Are you being made happy in the things that truly matter in your life today? For 90% or more of us, we would probably say no. And that's a good place to be. Because that means Jesus is about ready to teach you. He's about ready to take you to school, as they say. He's about ready to teach you some things that you really, truly need to know. Second thing, the searching question that asks for first place. Verse number 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, notice he called him, he didn't call him Peter, he called him Simon. Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou more than these? Of course, he said yes. He answered him, feed my lambs. He asked him a second time the exact same question. Simon, son of Joe, lovest thou me? He said unto him, yeah. He said, feed my sheep. Third time he asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He was grieved at this point. He said, why do you keep asking me that? He said, I really need you to know. Is basically what he was saying. And what did he say? Feed my sheep again. He's saying, if you truly love me, your life will be a reflection of that. Your actions will be a reflection of that. How do we know that we're saved? The Bible says that we can know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If we do what he asks us to do through his word, then we can know for sure that we're saved. Not that what we're doing is getting us or keeping us saved, but it's evidence in that we are truly saved. He said, if you truly love me, Peter, then you'll live it. And people will see it through your life. Lovest me more than these? He's asking. He asked this of Peter, the one who thought that he had lost his usefulness. Peter thought that he had just wasted it all. He thought that he had lost his use, usefulness. He called Peter by his old name, Simon. He met Peter where he was to consider himself, where he used to be. He called him by his old name because he had turned back to his old ways. And he's trying to get Peter to realize he had turned to his old ways. He had turned to, turned to the things of old comfort. He had turned to the things of his past instead of looking forward to the future. Is he calling you today by your old name? The Bible tells us that when we're saved, it says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We have an old man still lives inside of us, and we have a new man. That is your new creation that's made through the Holy Spirit regenerating you into the image of Jesus Christ himself. That's your old and your new man. If you're truly saved, you have both of those natures and they fight with each other constantly. You have to feed the one that you want to, to, to survive the most. I heard this story, I'll share it, very applicable right here. Um, Mr. Henry Klutz, first principal of Carson High School as it opened up, he shared this story uh, with the first graduating, full graduating class from the freshman class all the way to seniors. And at that graduating class, he shared a story of a, an Indian chief 
who was talking to a young warrior. And the Indian chief was telling the story to this young warrior that inside of him, there's a black wolf and a white wolf. And they're constantly fighting each other, trying to take the other one over. And the young warrior asked the old Indian tribe, um, which one is going to win? He was concerned about that. Which of these two things inside of me is going to win? And the old Indian chief said, the one you feed the most. That's true in your Christian life. You have an old man and you have a new man inside of you. Your old nature and your new nature in Christ. Which one is going to take over in that moment when you're upset with somebody? Which one of those is going to take over in that moment when you're the weakest? Which one is going to take over? The same answer, the one you feed the most. Are you going to feed yourself on the things of God? Or the things of this world. If you feed yourself on the things of this world constantly, that's the one that's going to take over and he's going to take you down. But if you feed yourself on the word of God, the new man, the new nature, the Holy Spirit living inside of you will help you, will control you, and carry you to the next level of your spiritual life with Christ. That's what he was talking to Peter here about. He was referring to him as his old name but making him realize he has a new future ahead of him. All he's got to do is look in the right place. And notice what Jesus does all the time. He never answers a question directly unless he finally just gets to that point he has to. Every single time in the Bible, maybe one or two times otherwise, when he's asked a question, what does he always answer that question with? Another question. He's trying to get us to realize these things for ourselves, to learn these things on our own. He asked Peter if he loved him more than the things around him, the fish, the boats, the fishing, the experience, all the things that Peter had turned to that night. He said, do you love all these things more than me? Do you love me more than all these things? Which is it, Peter? You turn to all this stuff, which is your old nature, I've called you out of that to be my disciple. Y'all see where this is going yet? Peter turned back to his old life. And God said, I pulled you out of that old life. I've now made you my disciple. I've given you a new career. I've given you a new purpose. Are you doing it? Because the first thing Peter did, the first thing Peter did after Jesus had shown himself alive to them twice now already, as he turned back to his old ways. And God's asking Peter this question, do you really love all that more than you love me? That's what he's asking him. Peter said, of course I love you. And what he answered, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep again. He's asking him the same question and saying, if you do, turn away from this old stuff. And turn to this new mission that I've given you. To be a true disciple of Christ is to feed the lambs of God. To feed the sheep. To feed the flock. You are the flock here today, by the way. Amen. And I am the under-shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. I'm the under-shepherd. He put me in this position for some kind of reason. I'm still trying to figure that out, I guess. But he put me here for a reason. He's entrusted me in this position to tell you the truth. And you are the sheep. And I'm simply telling you what God is trying to say. It's your job to listen. Amen? It's your job to let God speak to you as he's speaking through me and as he speaks to us through the word of God. And Jesus is asking Peter all these questions. Do you love me more than the sea? Is what he was asking him. Do you love me more than this boat? Do you love me more than the nets, which, you, uh, which used to mean so much to you? Do you love me more than these things? Do you love me more than the fish? Do you love me more than these friends? Do you love me more than the experience of doing something of your own hands and thinking that's all this is really about? Do you love me more than all of this? Is what Jesus was asking. This question asked three different times corresponded perfectly to to Peter's three times of denial. You see, when you deny Christ, Christ is going to come back and try to help you with that. He's not going to disown you the way we do him sometimes. He's going to come back. And because Peter denied him three times, Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you really love me? 
If he had asked, if Peter had denied him 50 times, I guarantee you Jesus would have asked him 50 times, Peter, do you really love me? Simon, do you really love me? Refer to him by his own name. Do you really love me? He's kind of trying to get Peter to realize he had reverted backwards. And now he's got to learn from that. And he's got to move forward. He's got to come closer to Christ than he ever has before. And that's the third question that he asked Peter. And that's the question he's asking you. That's the question he's asking me. The stern question that asked Peter to follow Jesus. Look at verses 21 and 22. Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, what will this man do? So he saw John standing there because Jesus had told him to feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, follow me. And immediately, what did Peter do? He turned around and looked at everybody else. We need people to come out and help with the art sale. Everybody's looking at who else, who's going to show up, right? We need people to come down here and do some work at the church. Well, what's that person over there going to do for the art sale? What's that person over there going to do for the church? What's that? No, I asked you. That's what Jesus is doing here. He asked Peter, follow me. And Peter immediately turned and looked at everybody else and said, well, what about them? God said, who cares? Don't worry about them. I'll take care of that is what Jesus is saying. I ask you to do something. Are you going to do it? That's what Jesus is getting through to Peter here. Peter turned in verse 20 and seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved and who also leaned on his breast at the Last Supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And they asked who it was. And he looked at John, the very one that asked the question. He said, what about this guy? What are you going to get him to do? Jesus said unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? He's saying if I don't ask him to do a single that blessed thing, what is that to you? I've asked you to do something for me, Peter. Do it. Don't worry about those other people. Because when it all comes down to it, folks and friends here today at Lane Street Baptist Church, when you die and you stand before God, you can't point no fingers at nobody but yourself. You will be held accountable for your actions, your decisions, your thoughts, and your words, and your deeds when you stand before God face to face. You can't point a finger at nobody else. And when he says, why didn't you do the things that you should have done for me when you had the opportunity in your life? Ain't going to be nobody around you to point your finger at. You're going to have to accept all that blame. Ain't nobody else going to raise your kids. Amen? Amen? We can blame our teachers. We can blame our preachers. We can blame whoever else we want to blame. We can blame TV and iPads and iPods and all the rest of that. But nobody else is going to teach your kids the way they need to be taught. You need to do it. And I said this statement before on the Father's Day message. I said, Tom, sometimes we teach our kids things we don't realize we're teaching our kids by not teaching them. If we sit on our honkus and we don't go to church, we're teaching our kids it's okay to sit at home on their butt and not go to church. If we don't get up and go visit, if we don't get out our Bible and read it in front of them, we're teaching them it's okay for them not to do it too. Ain't nobody going to teach your kids anything but you. Don't leave it up to nobody else. Ain't nobody going to teach your spouse anything. Ain't nobody going to teach your grandkids. Don't expect just other people to teach children what they need to know. Because they're going to learn something somewhere from somebody or something. They're going to learn. Are they learning the right thing? Are we teaching them correctly? Are we leading by example? Are we doing what we ought to do? Here's the question that God asked Peter. Follow me. And Peter immediately turned around and pointed his finger at everybody else and said, well, what about them? Jesus said, don't worry about them. He says, if I will that he tarry till I come. That word tarry simply means remain. Simply means just sitting here doing nothing. If, I, if I'm okay with him not doing anything till I come, what is that to you? Follow thou me, is what Jesus says. Christ told Peter, 
that he was to feed the Lord's sheep and that he would one day die as a martyr for his efforts. That's what Jesus asked of him. Do you get that? Let's look back in verse 18. He told him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. In verse 18, he continued the thought, verily, verily, I say unto you, when you were young, you girdest yourself. You helped yourself. You walked us where you wanted to go. You got yourself up. You got yourself ready. And you did the things that you wanted to do. But when you're going to be old, you're going to stretch out your hands to somebody else. And another one's going to help you and carry you where you would not be able to go. He's saying you're going to live. You're going to get old. And you're going to die. But you need to do it for my cause. You need to do it for my sake. And that's when Peter turns and said, well, what about everybody else? That's the number one question church folks ask each other when they're asked to do something for the church. What about everybody else? And I'm the same way. If I have the option of making a decision to get up and go visiting, guess what the first things that goes through my mind usually is? I guess nobody else is going to show up, so I might as well go do it. That's a terrible attitude for a pastor to have. That's a terrible attitude for a church member to have. Don't worry about everybody else. You just worry about what God has told you to do. And do it well. Do it till you die, is what the Bible says. Do it. Own it. Be faithful to God and follow Him. Follow me. Peter had heard that call before and he responded to it. But now he's a little bit older. Now he's a little more weary. Now he's a little more weak. But Jesus is still saying, follow me. I know there's about half of you in here feel like your day has come and gone. That your usefulness is long expired. It's not true. It's not true. Jesus told Peter, till the day he dies, follow him. Do what must be done. Do what needs to be done. Peter was concerned about what John was going to do for Christ. And Jesus said, what is that to you? Then he gave that familiar call again. Follow thou me. Don't worry about these other people. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing or not doing. You just follow me. Following Christ is an individual matter. Not dependent on what other people around you do. You've got to read it. You've got to live it. You've got to own it. You've got to believe it. and You've got to let it lead you in every avenue of your life. Jesus said, follow me. Jesus met Peter where he was, even when he turned back to his old ways. Jesus will meet us where we are as well, whether we're here where we ought to be or whether we're somewhere else where we shouldn't be. Jesus insists on having first place in your life, in my life, in all of our lives. As a church, Jesus insists on having first place. Jesus calls us to follow him regardless of what other churches are doing, regardless of what other church members are doing. Jesus calls us to follow him. How will you answer our Lord's three questions of commitment today? He's asking you and he's asking me the same exact questions. Do you love me more than all of these things? If we say yes, his answer will be, follow me. Amen. Let's stand as we close in a word of prayer.